In this video, we're going to study two final properties of x-bar trees, movement and null subjects. So what are these? Let's go back to a couple of videos ago. We studied a concept called a parameter, which is something in a language that you can set in one direction or the other. And this is going to have repercussions for the structure of a language. For example, we looked at a parameter of how the complement and the head are going to be arranged. In some language, you can have the head of a phrase first, like in eat, which would be the head of a verbal phrase, and then its complement, the direct object pizza, second. Eat pizza. So if your head goes first in a complement, you end up like English. Eat pizza. You could flip it and then have it like in Japanese, where the head goes last, and you would have the direct object first and then the head second. Pizza eat. So as you can see, you can switch the you can flip the switch in one direction or the other to choose how to arrange the words in your language. We're going to call this a parameter. And there are many parameters that we could use to configure the shape of a language. We're going to study two very important here. The first one, movement, is going to decide whether your question words are going to move, for example, to the front of the sentence or whether they're going to remain in the same place as the answer for the question. For example, you eat what? You eat pizza, which is how Japanese works. We're going to look at a third parameter, which is for whether you always need a subject in a sentence or whether you can leave it out. In English, you always need a subject, even if it's a dummy subject that doesn't do anything, as in it rains. On the other hand, there are languages like Spanish where you can practically drop any subject under the right conditions. So flipping these switches would explain differences between languages. Let's start with movement. And before we go to movement, we need to look at how we would have the tree for a question. These are yes, no questions in English. You have a sentence like you like pizza. And in order to turn that into the question, do you like pizza? We would need a complement phrase. This is the same kind of phrase that we used for subordinate clauses, relative clauses, complement phrase, uh, complement clauses. We're going to use it here to hold the question. The head of the CP is going to be like a feature that tells you plus question that this is a question. And you're going to put in there whichever question word your language has, if it has one. English does have an auxiliary that you use for questions, the, the, uh, the word do, as in, do you like pizza? So in a yes or no question, we're going to have the CP, and then the head of the CP is going to be the auxiliary for the questions, do, and then the complement of that um, CP is going to be the inflected phrase for the rest of the sentence, you like pizza. There are languages like Polish that have explicit question, uh, question words, like czy, it would go in here as well. But this is how you ask a yes or no question in English, how you draw the tree. There's another type of question that you can ask, which is a question with a WH word. WH words include what, why, who, when, and so forth. And there's two ways that these questions can behave. In a language like Japanese, you can have the question and the answer in the same place. For example, the first sentence just means um, Anna eats pizza. Anna san ga pizza o tabemasu. Anna pizza eats. The second one is the question. Anna san ga nani o tabemasu ka? Anna what eats? So in here, Anna what eats? Anna pizza eats. You can see that the question and the answer are in the same position. Uh, contrast this with English, where the question and the answer are in different positions. Here we have Anna eats pizza. But the question word appears all the way to the front. What does Anna eat? So um, the what appears somewhere else. But it also bears relationship with this verb because whatever you whatever is happening to what it's being eaten <laughs> this is the verb that's acting on the what so this word the question word must have 
some connection to this position, but then also moved to the front position. We're going to call this property WH movement. In WH movement, we're going to have a CP, which has the head uh, for the question auxiliary, does, does Anna eat? <laughs> and the specifier position of CP is going to have the WH word, what. But we're also going to have an additional element. Again, this what derives some of its meaning, some of its properties from the verb to eat. So there must be some relationship between the two. We're going to symbolize that with a trace that we're going to leave in the position of direct object for the verb eat. So we have this direct object, we're going to call it a trace, and then we're going to say that the what moved from that position onto the specifier of CP, and that it left a trace behind it, so that it could link this position, the direct object position, with the WH word on top. This, is, this uh, property is going to be WH movement. There are languages that don't need this. There are languages where the question word appears in the same position at its, as its answer, as in Anasanga, nani o tabemasu ka? We're going to call such a language a WH in C2 language because the question word remains there. So as you can see, you can have a switch for whether your WH words move or stay in the same place as the answer. This is going to be another parameter. Let's look at one final property of these trees, um, in a uh, property called prodrop for whether you can leave out your subject. In some languages, you always need a subject, even if it's not doing anything. For example, in she eats pizza and she arrived, it is very clear that she is doing something. However, take a look at the sentence, it rains. What is, what, what's raining? What is it? It's just, I mean, the rain just happens. So this little pronoun here is a um, something that the structure of English demands. English demands that there always be a subject to a sentence. On the other hand, there are languages where you can leave the subject out under some circumstances. For example, in Spanish, if you already know who, are, who you're talking about, you could just say, come pizza, eats pizza, and then you know that it's he or your friend or whoever. You can say, llegó, the person arrived, and you can just say, está lloviendo, raining, which in English would need the it is raining word. So in some languages, the subject can drop. We're going to call these languages, like Spanish, pro-drop languages. We're going to call languages like English non-pro-drop, because they cannot drop the subject. In English, you always need a subject, even if it's a dummy one, like an it rains. On the other hand, in languages like Spanish, you don't need an explicit subject. However, in our minds, there's always somebody doing an action. If you, even if you drop the subject, you always know from context, like who is supposed to be doing it. The verb also helps you decipher it. So you always go, so we're going to represent that knowledge by having a special subject called a null subject, which would be invisible. We're going to call it a little pro, which we like for little replacement pronoun. And we're going to put it in the same position as the subject to so sort of be like a placeholder there for that knowledge we have in our brain that there's, there is a subject, we're just not saying it. So English is non-pro-drop and Spanish is pro-drop. Um, other pro-drop languages include Japanese. Japanese is pro-drop. And on the other hand, other non-pro-drop languages like English are French and German, where you always need subjects. In summary, you can see how uh, these parameters, these little switches, can have a lot of implications in the structure of a language, whether you have your head first or last, whether you move questions or not, and whether you drop subjects or not. And you can also see how all of these languages look different, but deep down they're practically the same. In all languages, the syntactic structure is virtually the same set of rules, except with some flips here and there. 
if you were analyzing these languages, you'd think that essentially all languages are the same, except that there are some key switches that are set in one direction or the other. So some combination of the switches makes English, some combination of the switches makes Spanish, some other combination makes Japanese. But deep down, they're all the same. This is the main idea behind generative syntax, that all of the structures are extremely similar, except for a few variations in their arrangements.